All right, test one, two, there we are. I knew y'all were short-handed, but you, you got it. You got it. Uh, I don't see my wife anywhere. Uh, maybe she'll come in. Cheryl, would you mind closing? Well, no, there's somebody. I just want to go ahead and close that door. Sharon, can you close that door, please, ma'am? <laughs> There we go. <clears throat> there she is. It's good to see everybody tonight. It's been good to be in the house of the Lord. We're going to go ahead and get started. And uh, Brother Rodney's going to be bringing a message tonight. And that's uh, I always love that and get to sit back and enjoy that. But we have got a ton of announcements. I, I'm just going to work my way through them pretty quick here. And uh, remind everybody, uh, let's see, the 22nd, now to start with, the 22nd, I know that's on here somewhere, uh, there's no Awana on Wednesday night, okay, so if you, you just keep that in mind, that that is not this coming Wednesday, right, but the next, I believe. So uh, sign up tonight, if, if you want the Wednesday night supper for next week, uh, make sure you get signed up, because that's... That helps. It was a hundred and almost 140 people signed up last week. I think people just like fish. I believe that's what it is. But uh, here's something that's uh, happening this weekend. And uh, Miss Kelly Norman called today and wanted us to let this be known in our church. But the Veterans Day celebration show. They're doing a show at the high school. The shows like they do. I don't know exactly what it is, but it's on Friday and Saturday at 7 p.m. and on Sunday at 2. This is for the veterans, and if you're a veteran here, uh, it's free. I think you have to pick the ticket up at the True Five where uh, Wade, the credit union there, maybe another place. But if you're a veteran, you just go get your ticket. It's paid for. And then also to let, uh, let the congregation know that they would love to have people to come 30 minutes early. That would be at 6.30 on Friday and Saturday or 1.30 maybe on Sunday to hold flags for when they show up to be, you know, to be there holding flags and things like that. So, if, you know, if that's something you want to be a, a part of, and I think it's, it's, it's very, very good, uh, there's, there's information that you might not remember these times, but you can look on there and see. But Friday, Saturday at 7, Sunday at 2, this coming weekend. Also, um, tonight, right after church, 8 to 9, if the, the choir is going to crank up and see what we can do with a couple of, <laughs> couple of Christmas songs. And uh, so uh, we'll, we'll try to get over there as quick as we can. Oh, oh, Rodney's really, really good at hitting it right on the time, right on time. What is it? The north modular. North modular, yeah, just go out and take cut into the north north side there into the north margin. Uh, if next Sunday is the deadline for uh, shoes for the Isaiah. If you haven't done that and want to, make sure you get them in. Uh, November the 16th, that'll be a week from tomorrow at my house at 1 p.m. Our v the VIPs will be there enjoying some finger food or whatever they bring and singing some hymns and just kind of having a, a good time together. 60 and above. If you're 60, and above. Uh, also, on Friday night, November the 17th, there's what is called a widow's giving. I think kind of a little play on Thanksgiving, but it's widow's giving. And that's at 6, 6 p.m. in the U Sanctuary. Uh, November the 18th on Saturday. we got a lot of stuff happening, folks. Uh, Saturday morning at 8 o'clock, men's prayer breakfast, and that's been really, really good. We encourage any of you men, if you would come, just make sure you get signed up so we'll uh, know how much to prepare for uh, for breakfast. Uh, also, then Sunday evening, 
at 5 o'clock on the 19th, Thanksgiving, the Sunday before Thanksgiving, we will have a Thanksgiving feast here. Church is providing the meats and the dressing. Just bring, your, bring a good dish, and we'll have a, a good Thanksgiving meal together uh, the Sunday before Thanksgiving. Uh, also, the 19th, that, that day will be the, the final day for bringing food in for the uh, Thanksgiving baskets. We've got three or four, I think, uh, families uh, so far, I believe, that we are uh, going to be trying to minister to. Um, also, this coming Sunday, this coming Sunday is the last for the uh, Operation Christmas Child, the shoebox. So if you need to get that in, it needs to be gotten in this, uh, this coming Sunday. Um, I see, yeah, I think uh, yeah, I done mentioned that. The Luanas, uh, we do have a baby shower for Kristen, uh, Kristen and J Jeremiah, and uh, that's uh, December 2nd from 11 to 1. Uh, there will be a, a VIP Christmas banquet uh, December the 8th on a Friday night, 5.30, starting at 5.30. And then again on the 21st, the widows are having a Christmas party, so we just we just go and have a high old time around here from the rest of the year. So just a lot of stuff going on, and uh, so just uh, try to remember that and stuff on the bulletin board if you need to check it out. But uh, we want to move right on into our uh, our prayer time and get Brother Rodney on up here. But I, I do want to mention uh, uh, Mike Spivey, be praying for him. He was flying back home today from Houston. I think he is. He may be home by now. I'm not sure. But uh, uh, I don't know exactly. I hadn't got particulars on it, but uh, I think that they were kind of pleased maybe with what they what was going on. So we, we'll find out more about that. Uh, Miss Donna Cruz, I visited her uh, today. Uh, she, she's just uh, she's not doing well at all. And, you know, apart from the uh, miracle of, from the Lord, uh, she, she, she's going to go on to be with him. And I just got to share with the, the, uh, one of her sons there and to talk with her. It's just it's a precious, special time. She's, she's quite a lady. She's quite a lady. She's blessed my heart tremendously. But she needs our prayers, and they need, the, the whole family does, need our prayers. Uh, for Brother Odell Griffiths, continue to pray for him through the rest of the month, till the end of the month, that they can, that they'll try to do something something there to find out exactly what that spot is on his pancreas and then uh sister kim lucas she had a knee surgery today this was actually the other knee she's had it and it went well the first one went well and so we're praying that this one goes well for her and uh, she's she was headed home when i got talked with uh jeffrey and uh she was on her way home so things had went pretty pretty good today so we thank the lord for that but keep her lifted up that that it'll straighten out and uh, be a success so i'll open it up anybody got a prayer request uh, or a praise to thank god yeah i'd like to ask for a prayer for my brother-in-law rodney lee and his wife he's going through uh, the first stages of dementia and uh, she's tending to him the best she can so keep them both in prayer rodney and joy lee Brother Eddie, Andy, uh, and stepdad, Woody Sharp, uh, his health is failing quickly, and he's going to see his maker soon. He doesn't believe in God, and we'll tell you so. Uh, we've witnessed to him, testified to him, and can't seem to get him to understand, but uh, pray for Woody Sharp's salvation. All right. Anyone else? Anything? Got another one? Where? Oh, okay. <coughs> um, this month and next month, I'm having a lot of stuff being done. I haven't put seeds was being done, and um, chores will be being done, and um, my infusion will be getting back next month. So, um, y'all been praying for me because um, the, 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 <laughs> See, sort of, 
Trust me, I'm going to have done. I can't lift more than 10 pounds, and for me to sit still, it's kind of hard for me to do that, so I can't be in the kitchen for the next eight weeks and stuff. So y'all pray that I won't drive my back crazy by trying to do things I shouldn't do. So y'all just pray for me for the next eight weeks. So, All right, be praying for Brother Robert for eight weeks and gave on. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else, anything? Yes. <clears throat> Mine and Paula's daughter-in-law, Allison, her younger brother, his name is Doc, Doc Theophile. He's 19 years old, was in a car accident on Cruise Road Sunday afternoon. Doc has neck and spine injuries and surgeries this week. It is going to be a very long haul. Um, we need to hear the Lord say, rise and walk. Take him in. That's, that's that. that is good. Thank you, Ronnie. I know... Uh, uh, Debbie put that out. I know probably a lot of y'all y'all saw that. So he needs our prayers right now and for everything that he's going to be going through and that God will just show himself through it and that no, uh, everyone will see that the Lord has truly blessed that young man. So let's keep him lifted up. Anyone else? <clears throat> That's good. She told me a while ago that she she looked at me and said, "You know, you you don't look as good as I thought you did." <laughs> That's not true. That's not true. Thank the Lord. Yes. What's that? Okay. Okay. Thank you, Andy. Appreciate that. Andy thinks I look good if nobody else does. That's so good. That's good. It's good to laugh, isn't it? Yes, it is. Anything else? <clears throat> Anyone? All right. Well, let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And as I always ask anybody, you just feel free to come to the altar if you want to do that. Uh, so no, it doesn't bother me at all. But uh, it's just a time that let's, you've heard what's been said. And let's just, uh, just talk to the Lord. And uh, especially these that are struggling really, really really hard, especially the the guy that Woody doesn't believe in the Lord and he's <clears throat> his health failing quickly, probably needs prayer worse than anybody. Amen. You know, so folks, it, it, it's all that matters in the end. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come tonight and it's so good so good to be able to call upon your name. Father, we, uh, we realize that that's a privilege that we have because of the blood of Jesus, and you made that possible. And so tonight, Lord, I just want to pray as we come together, as a body of believers here, Lord, that right now we all send our hearts and minds on you and uh, that you will bring back to mind these that have been mentioned tonight. There's probably a lot of folks here would things that they've never, not even mentioned, Lord. And we're going to bring the, all of this to you tonight. And I just pray, God, that you'll be merciful and uh, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll answer prayers. And, Father, we know without a doubt you are a good God. Uh, all, your, uh, all my life you've been faithful. And uh, it's just the wonderful goodness of God. And to know that we serve a good God, even whenever this life is tough, we can stand firm on the fact that we are children of God, and he is a good God. So tonight, as we come to pray, and pray for our folks here at Rayford Road, Lord, I, I just want to pray for Brother Mike Spivey and Jamie, his family. Uh, Lord, I, I, I pray for the healing, Lord, that, that you can move. There's, there's nothing, Father, that you can't do. And we realize and know that. But, Father, the plan was never to stay here forever. Lord, you went and you're preparing a, a place. And so, Father, I, I, just, I just pray for Brother Mike and uh, pray for those doctors and decisions they make and what they do. That you'll be with him every, every step of the way. And for our sister Donna Cruz, Lord, she's just an inspiration to my heart. And uh, though she's, 
just can't hardly, she can't move, uh, barely whisper, and keeps her eyes closed. But Lord, she, she loves you. She, she can hear us and just slowly move her head. And uh, Father, I just pray for her. I pray for Derek and Tyler. I lift them up, the whole family. Father, it's tough whenever our loved ones are going through things uh, like this. But, Lord, they need you right now with the peace that only you can bring and the comfort that you would give them the strength to walk day by day. And so, Father, I just pray your special touch and presence upon Donna. I'm going to pray for our brother Odell Griffiths, Lord. I, I just We continually lift him up, Lord, because we... We just, uh, we believe in prayer. We believe you hear us. Uh, your word says you hear the cries of the righteous. And Lord, we know that our only righteousness is in Jesus Christ. And Lord, you see us through that righteousness. And so, Father, I know you hear us. Father, I pray for Brother Odell that, that, that this there be nothing here with this spot that they're uh, planning on removing. And uh, that's, our, that's our request. You said we could make our request known. And, Father, that's our heart's desire. So we commit him to you for our sister, uh, Kim Lucas. Pray for her tonight for this uh, uh, other surgery on the knee that she's had. Pray, God, that it go well, everything's successful, and that it will give her some relief from pain that she's been dealing with. And, uh, Father, we, uh, we just pray, God, that you will be there with her tonight, touch her, and make your presence, Lord, just rest there with her. I want to pray for our brother Robert Demers, Lord, and he's got several things happening here in the next couple of months. And uh, so we're, we're just going to commit to pray for him, seek your face and whatever's needed, uh, what doctors do, uh, their decisions, things that he needs to do, whatever, Lord, that you will, you will give him the strength uh, to do what exactly he needs to do. So I just, I just pray for him, Lord. And, and, Father, I want to thank you for Robert because of the fact, Lord, you brought him through some very, very <laughs> tough, dark, difficult times, Lord, when it just didn't, didn't look good at all. And, God, you, have, you, 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 you showed yourself mighty. And, Father, uh, I pray tonight for uh, Rodney Lee, uh, his wife, Joy, uh, suffering dementia, um, Lord, I just, I just pray for, pray for them, pray for folks uh, like that, going through tough times like that, Lord, and um, only you, Father, can, can give them the strength, Lord, that they need, and uh, Lord, I, my prayer is that they, they both, they know you, uh, if not, Lord, that they will, uh, and Father, uh, then for Woody Sharp. Lord, he doesn't mind telling you that he doesn't believe in God or that there's a God. But, Lord, that's, uh, that's not what your word says. And so, Father, our hearts really go out to him. And, and I just pray, Lord, that you, you'll show him mercy and open his eyes and let him see the truth and let him call on the name of the Lord. For salvation, or he'll be eternally separated from a holy God in a place of torment. Father, that's that's what the word teaches us. So, Father, it's it's our job to, to love and care about people like that and pray for them. Lord, it could be it could be our prayer tonight, Lord, that that may move the hand of God in his behalf. So, Father, I just I pray for that situation. Then for a young man, uh, Doc Theophile, Lord, I, I pray for him. You know everything about it. Um, thankful, Lord, that you spared his life. And uh, got a lot of stuff ahead of him that he's going to have to go through from with back and neck issues. Um, Father, be with doctors, what they do. Through this, Lord, I raise him up. Brother Rodney says to rise and walk. Uh, that's that's that'll, that's our prayer. That'll be on our hearts when we pray for him constantly. Is that you bring him to that place, Lord? And and when you do, that he will see and know and realize 
that there's a God in heaven that has blessed him and raised him up and enabled him to walk and get around again. So, Father, we, we commit that to you. Again, Father, we tonight I just want to pray for our church. I want to thank you. I want to thank you, Lord, that you're there, you, you're here, you care about us. Lord, you, you move in our lives. It's, it's just it's, it's so good. And you've just been doing good things here, Lord, and your, your presence and, and, and it, just the love that we have. And, Father, I just, I just stand in awe of you. It's, it's, it's not us at all. It's your grace and mercy. But, Lord, we just ask that you will continue, God, to work in th this church for your glory, that your will will be done, and that you will be pleased. You're the one that will be pleased with what we do and how we worship and uh, proclaim the name of Jesus, Lord, and just reach out to people across the world and here locally, Lord, with the name of Jesus. So, Father, we love you. I uh, pray you bless our time here tonight, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good evening. If you have your Bibles and you would like to turn with me to the Gospel of John, we're going to be in the 19th chapter tonight. You know, every time we come through our, our sharing time, I'm just reminded of how blessed we are to be able to come together. Amen. I mean, isn't it good to be able to gather in the name of the Lord? Isn't it good to know that God promised that when we gather in His name that He would be right here with us? Um, I'm encouraged by the body and being able to be with other believers. You know, whenever we hear of, of people who are in desperate need of the Lord, uh, it's almost confusing and overwhelming. I mean, sitting here tonight and listening to the prayer request and hearing Brother Eddie pray, just the tangible presence of the Lord. And to think that there are people who deny and ignore all of that. Well, I don't hear any page turning, so I think that means we've all found it. And so if you have found either electronically or in print, John chapter 19, if you're able and you would like to stand in the honor of reading God's word. We're going to start with the first verse. So John chapter 19, starting with the first verse. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. Dear Lord, we do thank you for the truth of your word. We do want to honor you in everything that is said and done here tonight. You are the great high king, and you are worthy of all praise. Lord, I just ask that you would stir our hearts as only you can. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, knowing that you're going to be speaking to a Wednesday night crowd, uh, you have the benefit of thinking that most everyone who's going to be gathered is probably someone who maybe has walked with Christ for a long time. And when I look across our, our group tonight, there's a lot of life experience in here. And I think that's great. And it's great to know that there are plenty of people who have professed Christ, who actually believe that this life is not temporary, that you and I have been created for all eternity. And that we have an opportunity to be in perfect union with a God who loves us. And so as I approach tonight's topic, for that group of people, I'm wanting to caution us just a little bit that we never become um, soft or take for granted God's Word. I mean, what we're studying tonight is a very familiar passage. Some that some of us have known and heard our entire lives. And yet I'm hopeful that as we touch it again tonight, that in our lives every time that we think about what Jesus truly did for us, 
that it just drives us deeper and deeper into a love relationship with Him. That, that it never becomes just something that we take for granted when we think about the price that He paid for us. Now that may be for most everyone here, but I'm also believing, given how good our crowd is tonight, there's probably someone here who has not professed Christ. And so my hope for you tonight is maybe for the first time you will begin to appreciate just how much Jesus loves you. That, that you'll begin to think about the things that He bore in His body as a substitute for you. Now whenever I start thinking about trying to expand upon that, try to proclaim the price that Jesus paid for us, I, I do find it almost overwhelming. I mean, how do I actually come up with the words to appropriately describe the price that Jesus paid for us? How can I appropriately paint the picture in such a way that you and I completely understand how important redemption was to Jesus? That He actually would go completely all in in the way that He was going to demonstrate just how much He loves you and I that it was important enough for him for there to be a means for forgiveness that he literally would give it all. I mean, how can I actually expand enough to be able to say, do you really understand what it cost Christ to reconcile sinful man and holy God? I mean, if you really thought about what he went through to make sure that you had the opportunity to be in a perfect relationship with God the Father for all eternity. So I feel that heavily tonight from the standpoint of how can I do that appropriately? And the fact of the matter is you don't need to hear it from me. You need to hear it from the God, the Holy Spirit, who's right here with us tonight. And you need to allow Him to be able to take the truth of who He is and what He has done and drive it home in your life. And what I hope as we go through this tonight, that I'm going to make just some pretty simple points. And I'll get to those in just a minute. If you've been part of our Wednesday night conversations for quite a while now, we've been working through the Gospel of John. I love the book. I absolutely love it. I mean, it's a biography of Jesus' life. And it's an eyewitness account. John the disciple wrote it for us, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And as we've been making our way through this book and seeing Jesus' public ministry, we have now come to the end of it. If you were here with us a few weeks ago whenever I spoke, we read this entire passage, and just as a reminder, Jesus has been turned over to the Roman governor Pilate. Do you remember? That hypocritical Jewish church group has turned Jesus, the perfect one, over to the Roman governor. And what we looked at the last time that we spoke, we said that Pilate quickly saw the hypocrisy. And on three different times he says, I find no fault in this man. I mean, even the pagan Roman could look at perfection in front of him and say, I, I find no fault in him. But that wasn't the hypocrisy of the church group. The church group is completely aggravated because here Jesus is pushing them away from their place of prominence. He's basically blowing up their religious paradigm. He's taking their tradition and saying it's got nothing to do with what God has got established. Matter of fact, everything God the Father has been doing in the Old Testament has been pointing to this very moment and what I'm going to do for you. <clears throat> so here we are as we're marching toward Calvary and we're seeing the complete picture of Jesus' love. You remember what Paul wrote in the letter to the Romans in Romans 5, 8? That God demonstrated His own love for us and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so as we read this passage tonight, and we know we're just moments away from Calvary, what we are seeing is this great picture of Jesus' love. He has been on a three-year march of His public ministry to get to this moment to where He was going to be the ultimate sacrifice for sin. Hmm. What I really would like for us to be able to do tonight as we're thinking about Jesus' passion and we're thinking about what actually He did here, I just want to make three very simple points, I hope. I hope that we're able to leave tonight, first of all, with a common understanding that sin is awful. The second thing I hope that we can have a common understanding on 
is that when you look at the extraordinary price that Jesus paid to redeem me and you, it must mean you are of significant value. And then the third thing I want us to walk out of here with is God is great. And so if you just want to kind of follow the outline, if you will, sin's awful. Jesus paid an extraordinary price, and he was demonstrating the value that he believes that you're worth. And finally, God is great. And so if we're really going to start thinking about what Jesus is doing at Calvary, I do think we have to understand why he's there in the first place. He's there in the first place because sin is awful. Again, I want you to think about the letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the Romans. And I'll go ahead and foreshadow, if Eddie keeps letting me do this, we're going to end up being in the book of Romans before long. You're just going to have to work with me until I get through with John. But I would love the opportunity to teach through the book of Romans. I would. <clears throat> in the sixth chapter, verse 23, Paul wrote, the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Now, those are some pretty simplistic words. And I think for those of us that have grown up in the church, we fully, completely understand what those words mean. But let's just make sure that we've got a common understanding, and let's start with the word sin. You know, if I actually had the opportunity for us to interact, and I said, hey, why don't you define sin, I probably would hear a lot of different things. Uh, doing things you aren't supposed to do. Not doing things you are supposed to do. Breaking the Ten Commandments. I mean, there would be a lot of different things that people would offer up. Well, let me offer this definition to you. Sin is an offense against the holiness of God. I mean, that's really what sin is. It's an offense against the holiness of God. It's anything that separates you and I from His perfection. It is things that we do. It is things that we don't do. Sin, an offense against the holiness of God. If you really start thinking about that, here we are the created. And by our words and our actions and our motives and our desires, we claim to be more important than God. That's, right. That's really what sin is. He is the one positioned with all authority and here we are, the created ones, and we say, what I want is more important than what you want. Hmm. That sounds like a pretty risky position to be in. I mean, how am I going to stand in the presence of the omnipotent one and suggest that what I want is more important than what he wants? <clears throat> See, we are so full of our pride and our arrogance that we deny his truth. I mean, there are times in my life where I'm completely embarrassed by the arrogance of man's intellect, as feeble as it is. I mean, we are so full of ourselves that we actually will look at the perfected God and say, uh-uh, I want to do it my way. I know better than you. I mean, just think about how our arrogance plays out. We cheat on our spouses. We redefine marriage. We kill our babies and call it reproductive rights. We mutilate our children and call it affirming care. Any arrogance in any of that? See, if you really think about where we are today, is there any question in your mind that basically what we, the created, do we call good evil and evil good. Right. Do you and I live in that generation? Yeah. Is it completely all around us? Right. That's sin. And it is awful. It's rebellion against the holiness of God. It's an offense against the holiness of God. Sin. Yeah. And what Paul wrote in this passage in Romans, he said there's an implication to your sin and my sin. Matter of fact, there's a wage. Now, I, I was hoping when I was preparing, I'm like, hey, now you know the audience that's going to be there. There's going to be plenty of people who've spent their whole lives working. They know what a wage is. But I also said, well, we do live in an era when people think that they're entitled and that they need to be coddled and they should be given something for nothing. 
So I ought to be very careful here to make sure that I define a wage. A wage is something that you earn, something that you earn. It's compensation for your efforts. And in this particular situation, it is just compensation for your efforts. See, Paul wrote, because sin is awful, there is a wage. There is something that you're going to earn because of your rebellion against God's holiness. And what you are going to earn is death. Now, there's two pieces to death. There's the physical death Amen. that every one of us are marching toward. I mean, we called out the names of our loved ones tonight who may be pretty close to some of that. There's physical death that is only going to occur because you and I live in fallen bodies. That you and I are bearing the wage of sin. Short of Jesus' return, we are all going to die. We are all going to pay that physical death. But in this context, it's actually something much more than that. It is spiritual death. Amen. See, this sin, whenever you basically looked at God and you said, I'm more important than you, what I want is more important than what you want, you called out holy God. <laughs> and the wage, what you earn for doing that, is going to be eternal separation. See, he's basically going to say, all right, you can have what you asked for. Now, I want you to think about this just for a little bit. If you actually believe in any part of this Christian story, you should be going like, now hold on, God created me for a specific purpose, and that was for me to have a relationship with Him. And you mean because I deny Him for all eternity, that relationship's going to be broken? Yes. Yes. That is the wage. That is what you have earned for your rebellion. The wages of sin is death. Now, if you're listening to me here and you're going like, ah, okay, Rodney, yeah, you're trying to say sin's awful. <laughs> it is. Turn on the TV. Read the news. Listen to the radio. I mean, whenever we hear of mass murder, I don't have to call them all out. Whenever we look at world events, it is clear in your mind man is broken somehow, some way. Is it not? Amen. But if you want to deny all of that, you want to understand sin's awful, let's look at Calvary for a little bit. If you really want to understand how bad sin is, let's think about what the perfect one endured for you and for me. I mean, if we really want to wrap our minds around just how bad sin is, I need you to think for a minute what Jesus paid to do something about it. In the passage that I've read here, the words are very brief. John wrote in the first verse in chapter 19, Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. Now there's not a lot of detail there. And those of us that have grown up in the church, we've heard an awful lot about flogging or scourging. We kind of heard all the details that go along with it. And yet, all that's said right here in Scripture is he was flogged. And where my mind has gone is, I bet those first century readers of this document, that's all John had to say. Because when John said he was flogged, that audience completely had the visual that went along with that. I mean, it's not that Jesus was the only one that was ever flogged. I share a lot of times in Sunday school growing up in church, Eddie didn't hear about the three crosses. I pretty much thought them three people were the only folks ever crucified. Now, when I got older, I figured out that's not right, that actually the Romans did an awful lot of it. They would line the streets with crosses. And so whenever we hear about Jesus being flogged, we need to think about that actual event. See, it sounds simple. He was flogged. But really, we got to wrap our minds around it. So with me, in your mind's eye, see the Roman guards. See them. Professional soldiers, the best the world has to offer. I mean, they rule the known world. And they look down on Jews, something fierce. That group has been charged with, I need you to beat him. See, I, I need you to beat him 
because his crowd over here is so jealous of him, if I can give them just a little bit of blood, maybe I'll take care of that lust they got for all of that. You know, Pilate's already reached the conclusion there's nothing wrong with him, but I got to give him to the crowd somehow, some way. I got to give him something. Maybe if I give him a little bit of beating, they'll be okay with what's taking place. Those guards were all over that. They're professional soldiers. They're hardened. They're good at what they do. And so in your mind's eye, be thinking about that scourging post. Now, we probably have all seen movies or we've all seen pictures. We probably have an image in your mind of something that Jesus would have been fashioned to. I have no idea whether it was low to the ground and he was draped over it. I don't know whether it was a high pole and he was strapped to it. I don't know, but there is some version of a scourging post, a whipping post. Now, knowing the age group that we have in here tonight, many of us, through love, were disciplined with a belt. I was. I see a bunch of hands. Um, we can't begin to understand the beating that Jesus is going to take. And he's taking it on the reverse. I was disciplined because of the love that my father had for me. Jesus is going to take this whipping because of the love that he has for me. Isn't that something else? See, what we've been told is that Jesus was whipped with an instrument called a cat of nine tails. And so I'm envisioning some version of a rod that's got nine straps of leather, and in that leather there's rock or bone or something that actually makes it even that much more harsh. And Jesus is going to be beaten with that whip. And I've been told that tradition basically tells us it's not that uncommon for people who are scourged to actually die at the post. That disembowelment was a real opportunity. I mean, I could just imagine seeing that whip as it wraps around his body and then it's torn loose. Can't you see that? And why is he there again? Oh, he's there again because he's my substitute. He's there again not because of his own rebellion, but because of my rebellion. That he's actually paying the price to offer redemption for me and for you. Now, I would expect someone to go like, well, Rodney, that's pretty dramatic. I'm not 100% sure you got that all right. Well, let me read this verse to you in Isaiah chapter 52. So this is hundreds of years before Jesus' life. Isaiah the prophet talks about this event. And in the 14th verse, Isaiah says this, His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness. Do you hear that? Isaiah said Jesus is going to be beaten to the point that he no longer looks like a man. See, the reality of the price paid is not the nice, pretty, stained glass window with a little bit of blood trickling down Jesus' forehead. That's not what he did for me and you. Beaten to the point that he no longer looks like a man. That's not all he did. D did you catch some of the other things that I read in those three verses? It says that those guards crowned him and clothed him. You know, in a different context, that may sound appropriate. I mean, this is the eternal king of kings. He does deserve a crown. Matter of fact, all of the precious jewels of the entire universe couldn't come up with the things that it needs to to actually properly adorn, adorn him, right? I probably didn't say that word right, but it's just not going to be enough. It's not going to be. Um, my work from time to time takes me to London, and I can't stand that trip. It, it takes me there, and I have on numerous occasions gone through London Tower, and that's where they keep the crown jewels. So I've seen those crown jewels. I, I have seen what man thinks is the appropriate thing for a king to have. Is that what Jesus got? No, the eternal king of kings, who's there demonstrating the love that he has for me and you, they actually fashioned a crown of thorns and impaled him with it. Can you imagine? It says he's clothed, clothed in purple. 
Isn't that royalty? See, in that same tour in London I've done, I've seen all of the different um, armor-bearing stuff, uh, all of the things that you would think medieval knights, all of that kind of stuff. I've seen what people think that royalty are supposed to be dressed like. I've seen all of that. Well, here we've got Jesus. He's been beaten to the point that he no longer looks like a man, and then a robe is put on him. Just think about the clotting if you don't think about anything else. And why is he doing this? Oh, yeah, because he loves me. It, it says that Jesus was hailed. Well, now maybe we're getting someplace because he deserves all praise and worship, does he not? I mean, doesn't he? He, he deserves all praise and worship. These guards are going to hail him. Hail, King of the Jews. But you know good and well they were mocking. You know, and I have found myself going like, man, how did they do that? How could they possibly do that? How could they possibly mock him like that? And then I got to thinking about how you and I do it all the time with our actions. They will say, yeah, Jesus is king of kings. And then we'll walk right out there and act like the way we act. I'll show up at them sporting events and act like a fool. Mm. We'll show up at work. And we'll steal time from our employers all the time saying Jesus is king. I'll sit in judgment of you. Mm. Hail, Jesus, king of the Jews. All of this I'm talking about is before the crucifixion. <laughs> we haven't gotten to the cross, we haven't been nailed to the cross. We haven't begun the death, which is really just suffocation. Oh, what a price he paid. Oh, what a price he paid. And please remember, he is not paying for his own faults. He is paying for yours and mine. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 through 6. Surely he took up our pain. And bore our sufferings. Yet we consider him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. <laughs> the punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. Do you hear all the substitution? Do you hear it? We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, if you're working with me through this passage tonight, you're beginning to get a deep appreciation for sin is awful. I mean, our arrogance to where we basically would thumb our nose at eternal, holy, sovereign God is an offense against His holiness. That is sin, and it is going to be punished. If you want to start understanding just how bad it is, start thinking about the price that Christ paid to redeem us. Did it really take all of that? Apparently so. Because if it's God's plan of redemption, it could not possibly be any better than the way it was executed. So if you're following me at all, you're looking at these real simple words. Pilate had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe. They went up to him again and again saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. And you're hearing those words, and even though they're familiar, you're not taking them for granted. They're striking a chord once again, and they're just driving you to repentance, are they not? They're just driving you to, really, God, you love me that much? If you're really willing to do all of those things, God, what are you saying about the value that I am for you? Because I'm going to be honest with you. Whenever I look at the price that was paid, it looks to me like he overpaid. 
So then my final point is this. God is great. God is great. I mean, how can you and I look at Jesus' public ministry? How can we be reminded of the words and the way that he taught? How can we be reminded of the miracles that he performed? How can we see all of that coming together, declaring his deity, and then marching us toward Calvary and not sit back and say, God, you are so great. You are so great because you have done something for me that I can't possibly do. You have placed conviction in my life to I'm aware of the fact that sin is awful. And God, you're helping me be able to see just how much you love me. You see, in conclusion tonight, I don't know your life events. I don't. I don't know how many of us here tonight have experienced great peace in our lives or how many of us have had great conflict. I don't know whether or not you've had good health or you've lived in constant pain. I don't know whether or not you've had the benefit of great loving relationships or if you live a life of loneliness. The fact of the matter is, I just don't know that. This is what I do know. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That God actually formed man out of the dust of the ground. And he created him for a purpose. And Adam wasn't the only one that was created for a purpose. That you and I, omnipotent God, knew us when he formed us in our mother's wombs. He formed us with a purpose. He formed us because he loved us. See, I am completely confident that eternal, holy, almighty God formed you that he knows you, that he loves you. <laughs> I'm completely confident of that. You see, the one who has all of the rightful place of authority, he's the one that's provided redemption. The word redeem means bought with a price. I've tried the best that I could tonight to try to just paint a picture just a little bit of the price that Jesus paid for you and I. He absolutely went all in to demonstrate, I love you. You do not have to be separated from me. Your life has purpose and meaning. You and I can be restored for all eternity because of the soul sufficient work of Christ. What's here for you and I is how are we going to respond to it? How are we going to respond to it? And see, I know that God has placed eternity in your heart. If you're here tonight and you're not a follower of Christ, I am 100% confident that God the Holy Spirit is calling right now. That He is impressing upon you who He is and who you are apart from Him. That He is helping you understand your sin and your rebellion. And I hope you see it for what it is, an offense against His holiness knowing that it's got to be punished. But then please see the opportunity for reconciliation. Jesus has already paid all of that debt. He's actually paid in full. Those stripes that were on his back were for you and for me. It has been paid in full. You don't have to pay it again. Please let the good Lord do a work in your life. Father, I thank you for the time that we've had to be together tonight. And I thank you for the truth of your word. And Lord, I just pray that you would draw us closer to yourself. We thank you for the promise that we have for all eternity based off of Jesus' work. And it's in his name I pray. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a clap of praise. Amen. He's great. Brought it right down. The God is great. It's amazing. Those pictures that was painted here tonight and just... All that that you try to even think about putting up with something like that being done to you, you. And he did it willingly for us. And uh, like Rodney said, I don't know. I don't know why he felt like we were special, but it's a fact he did. Or he would not have done that. We serve an awesome God. Amen. And tonight, Rodney just pleaded. 
If you're here tonight and uh, you've never made, made that right, uh, he did that for you. And uh, you, can, you can call upon his name tonight. And as we close out, uh, Brother Rodney will be right up here. I'll be here for a few minutes. And uh, we ask you, if you, you're struggling, something's stirring in you, just like he said, the Holy Spirit dealing with you about that. We just talked about a, a man who's up in age and doesn't think there is a God. But you don't have to go there. You don't have to be there. If you're here tonight and the Spirit of the Lord's stirring your heart, make it right. And we're, we're here to, to pray with you, do whatever we can to help you there. And so I want you to know that. But let's, let's stand, if you will, and, and, I, and I'll dismiss us. Father God, I come tonight, it's so good to be here in your house tonight and to hear your word, to just be reminded once again the great God that we serve and the awful, awful price that he paid because of the awfulness of sin and what it had done to us and how much he loved us and the value, Lord, that we must be to him we just stand in awe of you father and i pray tonight lord for anyone god that uh that you're dealing with with, the, uh, with their heart right now father that they would uh just just let us know lord just step out and let us know and uh, we'll certainly pray with them father and so we thank you again for our lord be with us uh, as we journey home father we just want you to know we love you we thank you we praise you we realize how much we need you every day of our life. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much.